evening, but given the <laughs> the interesting situations we have with time, it may be morning, it may be afternoon, or you may be in the loop. Um, we are going through um, some interesting changes around here. Subject of time has come up a lot here on CCN. This is the Con Conscious Consumer Network, uh, CCN, and I want to thank them for making it possible for us to do what we're doing, which is basically pushing the envelope and trying to push the rest of humanity into a place where they wake up and realize whose boot heel they're actually under. Um, but we will go through a time change in the next week with this show, and we'll announce that because I'm still horribly confused about exactly what happened to um, uh, GMT time zone. I thought it was GMT, but that's okay. Uh, it is the eternal now. You got to understand that time, specifically clocks, are a way that they entrain you. And uh, it's a, well, it's kind of a remnant of the industrial age, but at the same time, we're now in the digital age. And guess what? They're speeding up our clocks with the TikTok, TikTok of the computer. And now you split your consciousness in milliseconds. So um, whenever you can, however you can, take breaks from the, um, the man's clock and um, basically disengage from it as much as possible. Um, it, it creates a, a sort of disassociative state when we're constantly being pushed and funneled into time. Um, my guests for tonight are very interesting lineup. Uh, I'm going to bring my first guest up here in a minute, Rick Osman. Next hour, Michael J. Murphy joins me, and we will be talking about geoengineering, aerosoling, chemtrails, what in the hell are they doing up in the sky and why are they doing it? We'll do all of that in the second hour of the show tonight. But I want to introduce my guest who's on the air with me right now. And you'll see him sitting there. And uh, he, uh, Rick Osmond, was selected for the United States Air Force Academy out of high school and later attended Vincennes University. He earned an associate of science in laser and electro optics technology. He worked for defense contractors a number of years and then took a job with the U.S. Navy as a civilian with an engineering support field activity specializing in radar, night vision, and laser equipment for surveillance and munitions guidance. Most of his work was in the direct support of Special Operations Forces Equipment Acquisitions, and in that activity, he also became familiar with video conferencing technology. In those years, he was also reading everything he could find about weird and unusual history, hence he's with us tonight, uh, in natural history, archaeology, paleontology, geography, cartography, cryptozoology, cryptography, hollow earth theory, and that's just part of his credentials. He is um, he's the author of the book, The Graves of the Golden Bear, Ancient Fortresses, and Monuments of the Ohio Valley. We are talking about the hidden history of the North American continent, and I want to welcome my first guest tonight, Rick Osmond. Welcome to Off Planet TV. Nice to be with you, Randy. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you on, my friend. Um, gosh, since I, I already introduced you, let's go this route. You clearly had a lifelong interest in this. This is something that you've been plugged into for a long time. How far back does it go with you? Well, wow. uh, 45 years or so. Uh, I started when I was a teenager. There were a couple of old geezers in the town where I grew up who were also history buffs, and they kept telling me about these fortresses, a line of fortresses across southern Indiana. And I thought, yeah, right, sure. And then later on, I discovered that at least two of them are actually in the historical record. They are listed in the Smithsonian's uh, files and piles, if you will. And I thought, well, you know, maybe they weren't kidding me. Maybe there really were all these fortresses in a line. So I went and found the two that are known, and I put a ruler on a map, and I found a third one real fast. And the person who owns that piece of land invited me to come and look at it and, you know, make some appraisal of what I thought it was. And I do believe it's part of the system. I don't believe it was a fortress. I believe it was a little ancillary outpost type thing used for signaling. 
and the signal back and forth, you know, regular and consistently. And they did it with both reflected sunlight and with artificial light. So, and I, I have no not saying that without qualification. You're saying artificial light, meaning that they had some type of illumination that was generated by an energy force. It was a flame generated light, but they had better technology than anyone has ever credited them because right. of the way they could make shiny surfaces, use a reflector and generate a beam of light, if you will, rather than a big beacon fire, you know, a bonfire type thing. They did those too under certain conditions. And you can look on Google Earth or any of the good satellite imaging sites and you can actually see the vitrified soil circle on the maps and they'll mm -hmm. be on hilltop because that was what everyone could see big fire on a hilltop just like in what is it lord of the ring or uh, actually the hobbit the five armies they lit the fires across all the hilltops for all of the middle earth and boom here came five armies all of a sudden and that's more or less how it worked except it wasn't just for military things. It was also when the buffalo herds came through, they could say, okay, get over here. Time's are wasting. And from where I sit right now, you could see about 300 square miles of buffalo track. Wow. And it would be black with them. So, so who, yeah, there's a, there's a fire ring on this hill. <laughs> So who were they? Because I'm assuming we're not talking about uh, early American settlers as we know them, and we're not talking about Native Americans. How far back in history? We're certainly not, we're certainly not talking about historical period, period settlers. Right. However, to say all Native American or all foreigners would probably be unfair to both, because I believe that all the different societies who were here used the system to one degree or another. And then when a plague of some kind hit here in the probably 1400s, 1300s, somewhere along in there, the society and its technologies fell apart. You know, something we might be able to learn from if we actually study. So you're saying the 1400s, there were people on the North American continent who had civilizations that were established enough that they were basically setting up military lines. They had a civilization, and it appears as though if they had a civilization, they were also probably engaged in trade, commerce, and yeah. the arts of Long living. distance trade, in fact. Um, we, we now have, yeah, we, we now have sufficient evidence to say that there was regular trade between the southern end of Central America and the northern end of South America, and here, all the way up into Wisconsin, uh, in particular with the Mississippian culture, quote unquote, trade in cocoa. Mm -hmm. and we are getting a little bit grown there. north of southern Mexico plant and product. So it was, it was imperative that they had both a regular trade route and that they had communications that would stretch far enough to say, we want this much and here's what we have to offer for. It. Cocoa was used as a, not only a commodity, but also a form of currency within Montezuma's Mexico Aztec civilization. And we have that in the Spanish records. Mm -hmm. We believe pretty strongly that it was also in the Mayan Toltec Olmec Mixed tech, all of those societies used it right up until the advent of historical white settlement. There were other plants and products that made the trek as well, but it wasn't all by land. A lot of it had to have been by sea because cocoa, being a perishable commodity in addition to being currency, had a certain shelf life, even after it's ground up and uh, you know, prepared for use, it still has a shelf life when it's actually usable. Mm -hmm. So they would have had and to replenish it by, you know, person. Right. Yeah. It's a consumable currency, much like we have today, except ours is paper right. and loses value on a regular basis. It's fairly worthless. As did at that, this point. If, you let, 
you let it go stale, the cocoa would also be uh, stale and lose value. But it, at its consumer end, it also had a fairly consistent form of packaging. You know, like you, you get this bottle that's kind of a female shape, you know you're grabbing a Coca-Cola. Well, mm -hmm. when they had this type of pottery, they knew they were getting cocoa. And that form of pottery has been found at at least 38 Mississippian sites stretching from Florida to Wisconsin, as well as a number of southwestern sites, Chicago, Canyon, et cetera, and the Pueblos out in the southwest. This was a miles in places. Uh, mm -hmm. What the, what they were getting in exchange is what I'm really digging into because we don't have anything or anyone looking to find what was traded to the other end. What went south in exchange for this stuff? Nobody knows yet. I have some ideas, and well, those aforementioned buffalo might be part of it because they were everywhere. Now it's interesting because you're focusing on a geographical area. It's pretty, it's pretty long in terms of the United States itself. If it's going the whole way to Florida. Um, yep. I'm wondering, though, you focused your research on the Ohio Valley. And so the question becomes, what was the entrance egress area? Was it the Great Lakes? Or is that what we're looking at as an entry port? We're looking at uh, certainly a strong connection to the Great Lakes because of a commodity that was a very high value commodity that was centered in the Keweenaw Peninsula of Michigan, Upper Michigan and on Isle Royal out in the middle of Lake Superior, and that is copper in its purest native form. Uh, it can hit 99.7% pure copper. Uh, you know, any place else in the world, and I mean any place else in the world, you have to smelt it down to get the copper out of rock and various other uh, waste products, but not there. It's pure copper, and it is of high value yet today when you find it, because it is high impurity. In the 1850s up until the 1950s, the mines in those parts were just producing copper. They were smelting it, but they didn't have much slag. They didn't have much left over because it was so good. And we would not have a worldwide electrical system without it. Exactly. Well, but you're, I'm getting the sense here that we weren't running foundry operations. We weren't r running smelters at this point in time. And we're talking about enormously pure copper. So what was the state of this copper at that point in time that, that you're able to isolate? At, at that particular point in time, they would make a, um, a blank, if you would. A, a, a preform is what the archaeologists call it. And it would be like a bar, much like you would trade a bar of silver or a bar of gold. This was a bar of copper. And typically, it would be enough to make a spearhead or a small hand axe or one of these things. And you didn't really have to meld it down. You could cold hammer it and, and reform it or uh, actually the, you just heat it up without melting it. Much like you, you would black the copper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, exactly like that. Yes. But you didn't need to have a coke-fired blown forge to make that right. happen. You did need a bellows, but you could do it with, you know, good hardwood and uh, a furnace of sorts. Mm -hmm. And we found some of those. In fact, um, a couple of folks, three or four folks, working at Poverty Point in Louisiana, which is today about 75 miles from the coast, was at one time a major trading post and possibly industrial area for the preforms and copper um, utensils and ornaments, et cetera. And they, they had furnaces, so they could reform it. They may have even smelted it and poured it. Uh, they certainly had the technology to pour lead, and they did. Mm -hmm. And the archaeologists are just now coming around to the idea that whoever was here over the last 3,000 years used this technology on various metals mm -hmm. they also learned to fire pottery in ways that we can't duplicate today we don't know how they did it but they achieve things we can't do today much like some of the stone in south america we can't do that today 
Yeah. And yet it's, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, but, but I'm still focusing on all the things that went the other way because of primarily the cocoa. There were other commodities that came north. The copper, however, is one of the keys because by some estimates, a half a billion to a billion pounds of copper is missing from those two areas of the Great Lakes, Keweenaw mm -hmm. and Isle Royal. It's certainly not accounted for in the archaeological record, and um, or at least not in North American archaeological record. There are a number of folks who contend that it went to Europe and to Asia to fuel the Bronze Ages in those two places, which are slightly different times in history. We have ice core samples from Greenland that say that copper was smelted as early as 7,000 years ago. And we have um, archaeological evidence that the Copper Age was born in the Levant 6,500 years ago. Well, if they're right about that, then there's a 500-year time slot there where some So the copper age started, I don't know, it ended up with enough copper and copper oxide and arsenic blends and whatnot in the ice cores to prove that there was copper working, copper mm -hmm. smelting. They actually got it hot enough to boil off copper ions that entered the atmosphere and were trapped in the ice. Wow. That's, that's pretty so amazing, actually. Did it fuel the Bronze Age? Yeah, probably. It is. It's also amazing that the archaeologists will ignore that 500-year gap. The, no, the Copper Age started here at this time. It's like, okay, well, what who, who was doing it and where about, were they doing it? What, what era are we talking about? You said approximately 6,500 to 6,000 years ago? 6,500 60, years ago is when the archaeological community concurs that the Copper Age started and mm -hmm. that it started in what is current day Israel, Jordan, um, and Palestine, et cetera. But the ice record shows that it was 500 years earlier, but the ice record won't tell us where. But because of the air currents and whatnot, or what we perceive they were at that time, it was probably on this continent somewhere. But as you know, the Gulf Stream, flows around Florida and up past Greenland and on over to Norway, uh, probably carried a lot of air with it. We know it did. We just don't okay. know how much or what the flow changes are. But even given... So there that are a number of things that... It, I'm sorry, go ahead, Randy. No, I was going to say, even though, given the differential, the change on those two timelines, 6,000 years, 6,500 years, we're going back to what is considered to be the beginning of the epoch of recorded history as we know it in, as a Western civilization. In other words, the best scholars date biblical time about 6,000 years. Now, is that correct? I don't know. I doubt it. But it, we'll just put it on the, on the table here as that being the known epoch. So now we're talking about North America in a time frame that stretches across the expanse of our collective history right now. Yes. As far as written history, it's way beyond our written history. Uh, but by the same token, five or 6,000 years before that, someone was carving Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, well, our oldest village is 9,000. And yet we got this massive temple over here that someone buried to keep it safe. <laughs> yeah, and it is great all these animal figures and we don't really know how they carved those figures in because it couldn't have possibly had metals to carve the stone no well, my understanding is that those carvings are quite intricate intricate yeah intricate and look like they could have been done with something as precise as a laser that's been some of somewhat, them are very very intricate yeah and, and they still hold those edges that are phenomenal Something that I can't imagine how they would do it rubbing one stone on another one. No. That's, it's impossible. I just don't understand how it could be done. So the and history the history of North America 
has been lost, hidden, suppressed, or all three? You should add obfuscated. Yes, all three. Okay. Or four. I found enough evidence to convince me that our some of our founding fathers knew this and made direct efforts to hide some of the history. It's like, okay, why would they do that? The only thing that I could come up with is that the evidence would somehow provide some threat to the sovereignty of the young United States, as well as its predecessors, Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, all those countries that came in at one time or another under the guise and the law of papal bulls, it said, particularly one called Terra Nullis, uh, literally empty land. They said, if you find a land that is devoid of Christians, then you can claim the land and you can claim those people who are not Christians because if they're not Christians, they don't amount to anything. And that's what all those countries did. And to some degree, so has the United States, or at least they've hidden the fact that they knew better. Right, right. (laughs) So one of the main uh, uh, strings of evidence for that comes with Meriwether Lewis and Captain William Clark, who went on this little walk and boat ride out west and claimed Mm -hmm. as much more territory as the United States already had. In fact, almost twice as much. And they did that under very specific instructions from Thomas Jefferson. Uh, And those instructions followed the intent and the letter of international law for new land claims. They went out to Oregon, they planted a flag, they built a fort, they occupied the fort, they met up with their naval forces, passed a message, and came home. They fulfilled all the requirements to claim land under international law at that time. They knew exactly what they were doing. Now, part of the instruction that Jefferson gave Lewis Lewis lived in the White House for two years as Jefferson's personal aide. And for another eight months, he was going out and getting specialty training Mm -hmm. in preparation for this voyage. Well, part of the instructions that Jefferson gave him was, and I have to paraphrase because I don't have it in front of me, but if you find something that is a threat to the United States, write it down as an encoded message, a cipher, and send it back by any means necessary. And the only the cipher that, yes, a threat to the security of the United States. Take that uh-huh. for whatever you mean, mm-hmm. you, whatever mm-hmm. you think it might be. So that could mean that, oh, wait, I found a Christian church built by Indians 500 years ago. Okay, that would be a threat because there were already Christians here. Therefore, Terra Nullis would be null and void. And every subsequent land claim after that would also be known, including the current one. So Lewis right. and Clark both already knew this cipher called the Grand Cipher, which was developed in France, but it can be adapted for anywhere. Uh, and Jefferson certainly knew it because, well, he was the ambassador to France under Washington. And before mm-hmm. that, uh, Benjamin Franklin was. Benjamin Fran- yeah, of course, yes. And both of them were bona fide geniuses. The Grand Cipher is so cool, it went unbroken from 1635 to And it only got broken in because they found a partial key sheet, the British did. They they could not decode anything that France had for, you know, 300, almost 300 years. Wow. So... The Grand Cipher is one of the best possible ciphers for that type of information. And it didn't matter who was conveying it because they didn't have the key. They couldn't break it anyway. Was this something that came out of the Masonic Lodges by any chance? I I have never found any evidence that Jefferson was a Mason. 
Meriwether right, Lewis yeah. was. Lew- when he you know, founded Frank- the Los Angeles yeah. Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and even more interesting, you had a number of Masons serving together at one particular battle called the Battle of Fallen Timbers, Northern Ohio, 1795. Mm-hmm. They included Mad Anthony Wayne, um, William Henry Harrison as Wayne's aide de camp, uh, Meriwether Lewis, William Clark, and uh, a couple other interesting characters, um, one of whom. was Burr, but anyway, dead under mysterious circumstances, Wayne and Lewis. So perhaps Lewis had a change of heart about what should be done, but all mm-hmm. those folks were Masons. Interesting. It is interesting. The, I, I want to go back uh, a little bit. Go ahead. It is interesting. There's no way to prove any of it. <laughs> As far as proving the murders, there's no way to prove any of that. Not at this point, because the National Park Service won't let us dig up Meriwether Lewis's body, who was uh-huh. who died of multiple gunshot wounds during Flintlock days, and they called it suicide. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Shot himself twice with a to commit suicide. Right, right. That's like two shots to the head. Yeah. Yeah. One to the body, one to the head. Yeah, he had to finish himself off. But I want to I want to draw you back now to frame this a little bit historically. The the period you're focusing on here is very wide. It's a big expanse of time. Closer to our own time period, are we looking at an era contemporaneous with the Roman Empire? Is, is that where you're going with this? Yes, because anything that would be a threat to Terra Nola's claims would yes. have to have happened during the Christian era. In other words, after 33 AD. Right. Or at, well, after 37 AD, because the first Christian church was founded in Britain in 37. So, yes, certainly Roman occupation of Britain times, Roman Rome occupied, you know, two thirds of Europe and part of Africa and a lot of the Middle East. And there was also this mysteriously missing Roman legion called the Ninth Roman Legion, disappeared from history in 117 AD. Um, There are a number of films about it and what possibly happened to it, but there is no real history of what happened. So how do you make an army disappear? There's no record of it being disbanded. There's no record of it being absorbed by other legions, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you send them on a secret mission and you send all of their camp followers with them, which in that case would make it like 15,000 people. And you make sure none of them ever come back. Well, one of them came back and his name was Lucius Emilius Carus. And he came back 25 years later in 142 and he was appointed the governor of a place called Arabia Petraeus, a place that we call today the city of Petra. Okay. And if you saw and if you saw the Indiana Jones movie The Last Crusade or uh, yeah, The Last Crusade, Crusader, you saw this edifice, this big carved sandstone edifice. Well, that's real and it is the Roman treasury built by Lucius Aemilius Carus. It's been modified a lot since then. But in 142 he started building this thing as a tax collection point because the Silk Road that Crescent Valley, they called it in the movie, is the Silk Road to go to China. That was the route, the overland route from the Mediterranean to China. Mm-hmm. Well, the Romans, being smart, also would look for a different route because, well, it's safer, maybe. And they like to collect taxes on anything that went through portals like that. That's why they built yes. Adrian's Wall. It had nothing to do with military because it was ineffective as a military structure, but it was very effective as a tax collection structure. It was a toll booth. And that's what Carus built at Petra. And if he was indeed in North America for 25 years with all these fortresses along these rivers, 
collecting these tolls, then he was very good at what he knew how to do, which was collect those tolls and control traffic. Well, that's what I think was going on. And I think he's probably the key figure for that particular period of time. We have a number of Roman coins now in the several hundred that have been found along the waterways in North America. Mm -hmm. And you'll have archaeologists and numismatists say, you know, fishermen lost these lucky coin. Well, I don't know 800 fishermen that have Roman coins as their lucky coin or have them at all for that matter. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. No, yet, that, that'd be the longest running currency that I know of. They've also found other coins. <laughs> there was one cache of 52 coins found in one place. They had, uh, and it was at very near Clarksville, Indiana, uh, during a road construction project, a bridge project across the Ohio River. 52 coins from the second century, all Roman and all in one place, one double handful of coins. Uh, there wasn't a single fisherman dropped 52 coins. No. It didn't happen. We have other caches of multiple coins appearing primarily along the Ohio, but as far west as the upper Mississippi in Minnesota. Um, we have some on the Gulf Coast, uh, one or two along the East Coast. And there's, you know, there's no good explanation for how they all ended up here. And particularly with the time span which is about 200 BC up to almost 400 AD. So for, you know, for 600 years was the Roman trade of some kind. Well, maybe, but what we have right now is evidence. We don't have proof. We need both the written history and the archeological evidence, bind them together. And it becomes an irrefutable story. We don't have both parts yet. Do you well, believe that if it was a secret trade mission, we wouldn't have a written history now, would we? Well, that's true. But <laughs> secrets have been exposed throughout history because people do keep records. And I suspect that you suspect those records exist somewhere in some form. I'm, I'm fairly certain they did at one time. Whether they still do is up for question. Um, let's get back to the Masons for just a moment or more particular in this case, the Knights Templar. In 1170, I'm sorry, in 1172, the Knights Templar captured this, or recaptured, if you will, the city of Petra. Shortly mm -hmm. after that, they had a an entourage of people go to Britain from there, directly from there. They didn't even stop in Rome. They didn't stop any place. They got on a packet ship and they went to Britain. Another packet ship went to this papal seat, and they, after that excursion, got possession and control of a number of church, the first Christian church. The Templars ended up owning those properties. They were monasteries and abbeys and various properties. Mm -hmm. My contention, my suspicion, more contention, is that they were looking for corroborating records of what they found in Petra. So I'm pretty sure the history existed at one time. Does it now? I don't know. They were looking for North America. That's my contention. They may have been looking for a specific artifact in North America. Oh, really? That's it might have been a cup of some kind. The Grail. Yeah. There wouldn't be more now, whether definitive that's, proof of a Christian civilization than the presence of the Grail on the North American continent. That pretty much blows everything well, out of water. Yeah, it would, especially a land claim. You yeah. know, <laughs> the, the highest dollar thing on the planet right now is, is this land mass. Yeah. So that's where my book goes, and it, it takes a few sidesteps along the way. But it, my attempt was to consolidate all the things that don't add up with the things that should add up. 
So that's what I'm after in the graves of the golden bear. Now, one of the one of the civilizations or societies that I discuss a lot, which is really the core of the title, Graves of the Golden Bear, has to do with a Welsh um, colony to North America, at least a rumored one, along with a guy by the name of Prince Matic, who it turns out was a half brother to this uh, King Arthur the Second guy. I don't know. There was a King Arthur the First and a King Arthur the Second. Okay. King Arthur the Second, the Golden Bear. Uh, according to a couple of researchers in Wales, Alan Wilson and Baron Blackett, he was killed in North America. His body was put into a cave, desiccated or dry or mummified, whichever. Wales hid it in a different cave for two more years until his son was at the age for coronation and because they didn't trust the regent who was in charge. Well, I can understand that part, but so multiple graves, because he had three as a final, multiple graves of the golden bear. So that's why the title. So the speculation is that you believe King Arthur the second had a presence on the North American continent. A very short-lived one, but yes. Okay. Now, going back to the legal aspects of this, the papal bulls are historically very binding, and historically there is no termination point on them. Is that correct? That is correct. They don't have an end-of-life term. No yeah. clause for that. This is basically ecclesiastical law that is binding, much like, you know, the other forms of law, common law specifically. So extrapolating this for a minute, what you're going at here is basically a legal conundrum that needed to be concealed to prevent the legal claims that have been made on this continent, specifically the United States, by as a possession by what is now basically a corporate government anyway, and not a constitutional government. I mean, we're talking about something here that would theoretically go to the world court and unravel the entire land claims to the United States. It would, but not just the United States. It would Canada. also go to Canada. Yeah. Mexico. Mm -hmm. All of the Spanish and Portuguese nations in South America mm -hmm. uh, would be subject to change of an immense sort. Is it a practical thing? Probably not. But as a moral thing, it needs to be at least discussed. The United States is in a unique position to actually make some recompense to the natives because we have several million acres of the Bureau of Land Management land so-called public land that you and i can't go on incidentally yeah right so so much for public yeah and and it has oil and coal and other natural resources of high value of uh, well to whoever owns it if that's the native americans and maybe they could get you know something back yeah but like maybe the freedom uh, that would be a good place to start. You know, kind of, yeah, they are, in fact, legally, they are sovereign nations. Yes, they and are. That was, that was one of the things that Tom Jefferson understood completely. When we bought Louisiana Territory, we weren't buying the land. We were buying the exclusive right to trade with the natives who did own the land. Jefferson understood this. And all the land that was claimed as a result of the core discovery excursion to the West coast fell under the same category that kind of went away over the next 20 or 30 years, particularly with Andy Jackson saying, we don't care what the law says. Yeah. It's our Mani way. manifest destiny. And we're destiny basically kicked in at this stuck. point. Yeah. Um, and it has stuck and Supreme court after Supreme court has said, well, historically, blah, blah, blah. No, you should learn to read history because mm -hmm. it affects your decisions. 
um, there's one guy who is of native extraction. He's Shawnee. Um, his name's Robert J. Miller. And I had the privilege of talking to him for a couple of hours about this very topic. And he, uh, if anyone can afford his scholarly book, I suggest it because it is, it is um, a record setter as far as this is how it went down and this is why it was wrong. Mm -hmm. And he's got it in my opinion. Do you, do you happen to know the name of that book? Can you, uh, not off the top of my head. I don't. Okay. Well, I do some research cause I'd like to post that out if I can. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, he's a professor. Uh, he teaches law at Lewis and Clark college. In Florida. Wow. Yeah. No irony there, huh? Yeah. He's there for sure. So the, the Native American people so, have have had their land stolen from them, but even more than that, our history has been distorted profoundly by the suppression of this knowledge. This removes, again, an entire expanse of, of, of time from the chronology and the history and the understanding of this continent, much like, I mean, Okay, let's just go back for a minute here. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and you just go, <coughs> bullshit. Um, we all, you know, I think the people listening to this well, network. Yeah, and, and it's, it's not disputed that he made this expedition, this voyage. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would dispute was that he was, A, the first to do it, B, he did have a map that someone else had already drawn for it. C, that he had someone on board who could speak the native language before he went there, because the first thing he did was camp, uh, um, kidnap a native and say, we want gold, show us where it is. And the native sailed with them 150 miles away to go find gold. So he knew his geography real well, too. And he could communicate with them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are a whole bunch of things wrong with that whole scenario. We had the Viking slash Norse in North America 500 years before that. And, oh, that doesn't matter because they didn't colonize or they didn't make a claim, et cetera. Okay, that's fine. But by 1000 AD, by 997 AD, it was very much a Christian region, not just Norway, Sweden, and all the surrounds. It was... There were saints there already. Mm. <laughs> so it was very much a Christian uh, nation, Christian people who settled in North America. And it wasn't just Alonzo Meadows. They say, oh, well, that was just, you know, a, a ship repair station. Well, it was a ship repair station that had spindle whirls, which meant they had women because men didn't spin wool. And if they were spending wool, it means that they had farm animals or something from which to spin wool unless they were using North American bison hair, which there's a whole story around that too, in Greenland, no less. And they were eating uh, foodstuffs from 400 miles further south. So mm -hmm. somebody was conveying those foodstuffs up there to Lundo Meadows. And it was a large, fairly large bunch of people at Lundo Meadows, 60 to 100 people there. If that was just a a repair station, how many people were in the accident? <laughs> That's a hell of a repair station, 6,200 repairmen. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, you think about a gas station with a couple of attendants. Well, yeah. <laughs> this was a lot of folks. And apparently they were eating pretty good. And, and another thing about it being a ship repair station, if you go up there today, you won't see a tree. <laughs> there aren't any trees wow. around there. It's all bare. It's all grassland and rock because, well, it's Newfoundland. I'm, yeah. you know, it's more, almost more Labrador. It's not quite on the ice ring, but it's very close. So, you know, it, it doesn't make sense for that to be, you know, the only place they went or they would have never made it home because they couldn't repair a ship without having timber and the timber was all further south. 
So you believe this was a settlement and this was a settlement of Norwegians, Vikings? Is that what we're talking about? It was Greenlanders for the most part. Okay. Yeah, it was Greenlanders for the most part, but they were under the stewardship, if you will, of the king of Norway. In particular, Leif Erikson was a, was a steward, was a, uh, uh, what, what's the word they used? What was Robin to Batman? <laughs> Dick Grayson. Sidekick, a, a compatriot. Of, yeah, well, yeah. yeah. A okay, ward. Well, the ward. A ward. Thank you. That was, that's okay. the term. Uh, Leif Erikson was a ward of the king of Norway because Eric the Red was a criminal, an outcast, and his young son at that time became a ward of the king. And mm. Leif Erikson was on a mission for the king of Norway to make sure that the Greenlanders were going to pay their taxes and tithes, meaning, of course, that they were Catholics. <laughs> And if the Greenlanders ah. were, and if the Greenlanders were doing business in North America, then there were Christians in North America. So, hence the resistance for a very long time to the Vikings ever making it to North America. So, what do you believe today we can find? I mean, how much documentation do you believe at this point? Whoever support this, and how much has been actively suppressed even up to today um, in terms of documents and, and even sequestering the historical evidence that's been found, like the Roman coins. Who knew about that? Yeah, who knew about that? Well, two of those coins ended up at the banks, I'm sorry, at the Falls of the Ohio Museum in Clarksville, Indiana, two okay. of the 52. And they were prepared for display by making casts of them and making many copies, a total of 52 copies, and put into a, a, a display in that museum. That was when it was a privately held museum. As soon as the state of Indiana acquired that museum, that display went away. Because uh -huh. the archaeologists refused to, to acknowledge that there was ever any presence in North America of Europeans or anybody else before Columbus. Yet you have, and I back it to North America and Europeans, we have one particular archaeologically dug site, supervised dig, etc., in Wendover, Florida. Uh, this was the place where the skull still had the remains of brains in them, and they're mm -hmm. 7,000 years old. Well, they finally were successful in extracting DNA from those particular brains. What would and preserve brains? What would have preserved this, the, the tissue that long? They were in peat bogs, and it robbed oh. all the oxygen from them. Of, yeah, got it, got it. Interesting. And, they, and since then, they've actually found a couple in British peat bogs of that age. And, well, mm -hmm. actually, maybe related to the people in Wendover, Florida. But... So that's a little weird. Yeah, that's real weird. Um, it just seems like everything you're talking about here, we, we put this under, I don't, but everybody else puts this under the banner of alternative history. Well, what I want to know is, I think we're being presented alternative history. I mean, the logic tells you we were not the primogeniture of North American civilization. I've not believed that for many, many decades. Even looking back at what we were taught in high school, you walk around the landscape, you see things, you, you look at the land, um, there's signs all over. the. I live here in southern Pennsylvania. I live on the Appalachians, the Appalachian Mountains, and I spend a lot of time in the woods in the mountains. And to me, it, it, it seemed fairly obvious that there were other civilizations here a long time ago for a whole host of reasons. Did I have hard evidence about yep. that? No. But there's lore and there's culture that goes back yep. hundreds of years that's been handed down by word of mouth that's never been encapsulated in history. And, you know, honestly, Rick, what you're doing is preserving 
fragments right now that hopefully, you know, other people can build on because I think it's important to reclaim this for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is the legal, but also so that we can reclaim the history that's been stolen from us. Yeah, it, because it is our history. And when I say our, I mean, all mean of us. the term of the Native Americans, yeah. all our relations, because we are all part of history at this point. And uh, in southwestern Pennsylvania, as one example, Brownsville, it's right yeah. on the Monongahela River. Right. And it's a place where there was Redstone Fort back in 1760 something. Uh, and Fort Necessity was very close to that, George Washington's first military outing. Uh, but there was a straight line of the, we discussed the bonfire and signal mm -hmm. lines earlier. Um, off air, I guess <laughs> we we're discussing that, yeah. but yeah. there was a signal system, a signaling network, if you will, it stretched from at least Brownsville, Pennsylvania to Cahokia in Illinois. Um, and a number of the most important archeological sites, mm -hmm. mounds and fortresses fall on that very straight line. Yeah. And we at Brownsville, it's a unique situation because also, an overland route that comes to the river right there. Today, we call it US-40. But that route was there for thousands of years before that. You know, and, and I'm looking at the clock right now. We're running out of time. I got to get you back. We didn't even touch on the mounds. And those mounds, uh, just, I've seen some of those over the years, specifically in Ohio. And they're very cryptic. And we don't have good explanations about what these mounds are really all about. Or who built them or who built them. We've been left again with a shattered piece of history. That, I agree. You know, I, one of the things that I took away just reviewing your material is this concept that here we are in North America. I'm, I'm speaking North America here, but I know I have listeners on this network that are all over Europe and the Pacific Rim. The truth of the matter is we've been led to believe that, that all of a sudden this great civilization emerged out of the Western culture. But in fact, Men have been traversing this planet for a very long time using technologies that we really don't understand. Yeah, they certainly had technologies. We mm -hmm. don't know exactly what they used or how they used them. But we know that they accomplished these things, built these things. We can't duplicate today No, with any technology. Well, and, 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 and in the era before modern engines or anything, they were traversing oceans, dangerous, and, and I've heard you point this out before, sailing the North Atlantic, which is treacherous, treacherous territory. Um, and yet they seem to have been brilliant navigators who managed to go around the globe and, and navigate waterways that, that still challenge experienced um, captains today yep the highest incidence of shipwreck the body of water that has the highest incidence of shipwreck on the planet is lake michigan believe it or not the edmund yeah. fitzgerald yeah well that was lake superior but yeah it's similar to, yeah uh those that one is second only to is second to um the cape off south africa just about tied with the north atlantic Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, so we've really seen a lot of our history distorted in a way that favors a Western mindset and favors an American mindset. Yeah. And it is, you know, in my mind, it's part of the ongoing warmongering and hegemony that America has exploited upon the world. We, yeah. uh, well, and we, I've heard us called the second Rome before well, and there's we some are truth to that yeah yeah we are very much yeah you know, it's we take any invention that someone else did we make a little tweak to it and we call it our own invention you know that american ingenuity thing but mass production uh the printing press all those things were invented long before the western europeans got them. yeah they were perfected quote unquote by that particular bunch of folks yeah, and it's um, 
you know, it's just sad to see that we're so connected with each other historically that when you begin to draw the lines, the separation between people becomes so less when we understand how our history is interwoven rather than this idea of this great Western ruling class and everybody else is a bunch of primitives, which we know isn't true. We know it from any number of uh, frames in history. Right. And our leaders have done everything in their power to ingrain it into legalese. Yeah. Like I said, we're dwindling down on time here, and, and there's so much I would love to talk to you about, including hollow earth theory, which I know you're involved with. And uh, there's an incredible interest on that. We've got to get you back to do that. Let people know your activities yeah. a little bit, where they can find you, the book, um, all of that. Sure. I'll start with the book. It's The Graves of the Golden Bear, Ancient Fortresses and Monuments of the Ohio Valley. It's available on Amazon as either Kindle or print. It's also available through my publisher, which is Grave Distractions Publications. And no, that's not me. It just worked out that way. Um, it's also available from ancientamerican.com, Ancient American Magazine's website. And a few other folks have it uh, in other formats. You know, it's not just Kindle. It's also the Nook and um, Google Books. I, I can't recall all of the my activities. Wow. Okay, I'm playing bass about every weekend. But other than that, nice. I'm also writing for Ancient American Magazine. Uh, I attend a number of conferences every year. We actually held one here last fall. We're kind of debating on whether to do that one again as an annual or go biannual. I'm sorry, semi-annual on it. Um, but there's also the Ancient Artifact Preservation Society meeting up in Marquette, Michigan. Um, the Midwestern Epigraphic Society meeting in Columbus, Ohio, which is coming up, I believe, in May. Uh, several others. If you have a, an abiding interest in the topic, Go to ancientamerica.com or ancientamerican.com, which is two separate entities that cover much of the same genre. And I'm all over both of them. As far and as we'll, the Hollow Earth, the Hollow Earth Insider.com. Great <laughs> website. I've been, I've been really getting into that website. Like I you said, know, I, I need to get you back and we will we'll, we'll put all these links out see that i have links to the conferences and things as well just send those off to me in an email or over skype brother and uh we'll, we'll put all that stuff out when we put this the video out on the websites rick gosman i want to thank you for coming on for being generous with your time and for the diligence in your research of reclaiming lost history and stolen lands um we are expecting our next guest coming up here in just about a minute. And uh, I'll look forward to next time. Thank you very much. We will have you back, Rick. Definitely have you back, brother. Hollow Earth the next time for sure. Okay. Thanks. Good night. Good night.